Hi folks, we should make a start. So welcome along. So I'm Greg, uh, for those that don't know me. The, uh, I had a number of people but, uh, in the session yesterday, but it looks like lots more in today as well. And uh, so look, where I'm from, I'm from Brisbane and originally in Australia, and now I've been living in Melbourne for the last about 10 years or so uh, in Australia. And in terms of the SQL Server product, uh, I wanted to have a session where we just talked about things that I've learned over the years that I, I just wish people who are doing development were sort of aware of uh, in terms of SQL Server. Uh, I spend an, a large amount of time fixing up issues uh, and working in sites where things are just dreadful. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I often tell people we do a lot of architectural guidance and I wish we did a lot more uh, because we seem to spend an inordinate amount of time afterwards trying to fix up things that uh, really just should never occur. Uh, in fact, um, what, what amazes me often with people doing development is, is that often people are overly optimistic about how things will work. And uh, best example is I was in a, a small software house in Sydney uh, a, a few months back and there were a startup and there were 12 of them uh, working in the place and they had been working for four and a half years building an application, uh, software as a service application, and they had the first meeting coming up in two weeks' time with the shareholders where they had to show them what they had achieved. And uh, they had decided that if they could have a thousand concurrent users using their application, that they would have a viable business. <laughs> That's kind of how it worked. If they were down to 500 people, uh, it was a very questionable business. Up above a 1,000 would be good. And the reason they had got me there is that th they couldn't get past nine. <laughs> and uh, this is after four and a half years of work and two weeks before they had to show somebody. Uh, people, they were nearly suicidal, uh, the, <laughs> the people in the room. This is not the point at which you're really trying to make fundamental changes to how people have done the development. It's a, it's a very, very poor time to start doing that. And look, one of the problems with development is there are no right and wrong answers, and, and everybody will know that. I mean, it's a bit like anything that you're developing, there's always an enormous number of ways that you could develop something. So look, the first comment I'd make is that you might not agree with everything I say, right? And, and I'm willing to accept that up front. And I'm just telling you that these are things that I have, I have worked with SQL Server since 1992. So we were talking about it in a session this morning. Uh, so it was version 4.2, one at the time. I don't know if anybody else had worked with it at that point. Uh, but, but over the time, you see things that work and things that don't work. You know? And uh, there, there's often never great solutions to some things but there are better ways than others uh, to get to it. Uh, you'll also note that I threw in a, a few baseball slides here. I'm one of the strange Australians uh, where I actually grew up playing baseball. Uh, uh, that was a very odd thing in Australia. Everybody plays cricket, <laughs> and so that was, that was not the done thing. But anyway, so I, I liked the theatre of the baseball, so it was, it was great. And I spent a number of years uh, umpiring baseball as well and uh, through I, the, the highest level I got to do was like the Pan Pacific Games and things like that so it was sort of an interesting high level of baseball and uh, it, it's, you certainly learn to deal with difficult people, <laughs> that's probably the nicest way I could put it. But look, the thing about the opinions I'm sharing with you here is just trying to point out they're not just my opinions, right? So uh, these are things that I've talked to a lot of people about over a long period of time. And so, but as I said, feel free to disagree. And so, if you don't agree with it, fine. Take what you will out of what we say. And so, look, where I fit in, so as I said, I head up SQL Down Under in Australia, uh, long-term uh, SQL Server MVP, originally, now, nowadays they call us the Data Platform MVP. I'm um, part of the RD program, uh, Microsoft Regional Director program. That's an interesting one. There are about 150 of us worldwide, uh, and mostly what that does, it gets me on some very interesting mailing lists uh, internally w within the Microsoft people. So in many cases, I can also tell you directions in terms of where I think you should go. Uh, in many cases, I'm building opinions on what I've heard in meetings and things. I can't always say why I have that opinion, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but you know, often it puts at least in a good position to have an idea where things are heading. 
uh, was part of a certified master program, was an instructor in that program, and have written a number of Microsoft white papers and things as well. So anyway, that's where I fit in. So in terms of agenda, there are six specific areas uh, that, are, that I want to hone in on, like the things that I think are just fundamental problems, and then also just some general design advice in terms of the apps. So look, the first are uh, the category of what, what I'd consider code smells. And so anybody who's done higher level languages tends to think about code smells. These are things where it isn't necessarily wrong, but something smells wrong you know, about what's going on in that part of the code. And the, there's a number that are just straight out commonplace ones. So obviously, if, if you are building code that makes extensive use of cursors, Yes, you probably have a problem you know, in, in the code you're building. Uh, what's, if I look at cursors, it's not that I don't use them, uh, but it's usually that it, it's in a very rare situation. And when I'm making extensive use of cursors, it's when I'm building tools. And so things like if I have to step through tables in a particular order and generating script or something like that, yes, no argument, right? Um, cursors are perfect for that sort of thing. But we do not want to do all of the standard sort of processing in curses. And you'll hear an endless discussion from people on curses versus sets and so on. Uh, the, the real issue here is that SQL Server is a sort of a declarative, T-SQL is a declarative language. What you need to be doing is telling the server what you want to achieve, not how to achieve it. And the problem is that as soon as you start heading down a cursor path, you are telling the engine exactly how to do each of these steps. And that is not what you want to be doing. You want to be always trying to code at a higher level that says, this is what I'm trying to achieve. And that's the main difference you get with, uh, with sets. What I also see with cursors, though, is that people tend, when they do use them, they often use the default options. Uh, and the default options are not good, right? So the default options, unfortunately, are static cursors and what that's going to mean is that it will take the data that you go and select, and then it'll throw an entire copy of that data into TempDB, and then it'll allow you to navigate around inside that, but, but that's a really, really heavy duty thing to be doing. And particularly if you're trying to scale across a lot of users, anything where you take large amounts of data and put it in TempDB, that is not gonna help you, right, uh, in any way. You need to keep that, those things out of there. And in many cases, just simple changes to using read-only, forward-only cursors will make a big difference to the performance of those cursors. The second one is temp tables and table variables. Uh, in terms of temporary tables, I, I usually know when I'm going to have an interesting uh, se session of doing sort of uh, performance tuning, is when I open up somebody's application and it's just full of temporary tables and full of cursors and so on, you just know that this has a world of opportunity to, to work differently. But you also know it's going to take you ages to pick through how the thing works to, tr to try and work out how to do it again. Now, in terms of temporary tables, uh, temporary tables have been around the product for a very long time. And there's this uh, table variables appeared in SQL Server 2000. Look, I I'm not religious in terms of saying, look, don't use temporary tables or don't use table variables. Each of them has their place, right? Um, but one of the mistakes I see all the time is people talk about table variables like I hear them refer to them as in-memory tables. Well, they're not in-memory tables. When I create a table variable, that is going out to TempDB and creating an object in there exactly the same as it does when we do a temporary table. The difference uh, is that uh, a number of things. One is that they're not transactional. And so there are use cases for table variables that are perfectly valid, right? So a common thing is, imagine I have an application that goes and something, somebody is getting deleted, somebody's deleting some data, and I'm trying to work out who it is. A common problem is to have the code that goes in that tries to do the delete, then try and audit who does the delete, and then of course roll back the transaction, and then of course you've rolled back the audit of who did the delete, right? So I mean, that's completely pointless. So one of the things we can do with table variables, because they're not transactional, is that we can drop the data in there about who did the delete, then we can roll back the delete, then we can proceed on with the data that's sitting in the table variable. So for things like that, they're great. The, uh, the, one of the things uh, I did do is uh, write a number of white papers for Microsoft on plan recompilation and how query plans get recompiled. 
And one of the things that I, I found in that is there was a lot of advice in tools like the Best Practices Analyzer that said, hey, you've used these temporary tables, you should be using table variables instead. And th that's tragic advice in general, right? And so the reason they were doing that, though, is there were some scenarios where people could get a high level of recompiles occurring in their applications. And so what they would say is if you changed across to using table variables, you'd stop the recompiles. And of course, you stopped the recompiles because we didn't have statistics. So the idea is it doesn't know when the data's changed enough to cause an issue. And so yes, you'll get rid of the recompiles, but yes, you'll also get lousy query plans for, for almost everything you're doing. And so in the case of table variables, as I said, there's a number of places they make good sense. Uh, it, and it's typically where you're holding small amounts of data in the middle of something you're running with. But it's very, very common to need to pick the data up if you want to do proper joins and things off the tables. Clearly, temporary tables will do a better job. And the other place where we use temporary tables is if SQL Server, uh, I generally try and avoid too many query hints. I, I think uh, generally, it's, again, it's a bad sign if you're using lots of hints. But one of the scenarios um, that can sort of occur is that sometimes you know things that SQL Server doesn't know. Right? And in that case, that's a valid use for a hint. So uh, one that I gave the guys an example on Monday is that there is a hint that says things like fast n or fast first row, these sort of things. Now, SQL Server normally tries to execute the entire query with the least resources it can. But if you know that the thing that's most important to you is how long it takes for the first row to come back, that's something it doesn't know, right? So that's an example of something where, to me, a hint makes perfect sense there because you're telling it something it is completely unaware of. But the other one that can occur is that some of the operators have no estimates. So, for example, if you've used the XML code, there's a nodes method. And the problem with that is that the nodes method doesn't have cardinality estimates. So a, an example I've seen a lot is that people will build up something like they're a security thing and they'll have a little chunk of XML that says what group somebody's in. They'll pass that into some bit of code where they're using that to determine what you can look at. But the problem is that they use the nodes method on the XML to then join to the rest of the data. And the problem is that it doesn't know how many rows there are in the XML. And so it guesses numbers like 10,000, right? And the answer is you probably have six. <laughs> you know? And so things like that, it can end up really, really poor. And so in those cases, again, often taking the data out of like a nodes method, pushing it into a temporary table where we get statistics and so on, and then doing the joins to that makes perfect sense. But if your main logic that I see all the time in people's applications is select a bunch of rows into a temporary table, then update them, then update them, and then update them, and then update them, select all the answers out, and then delete the temporary table, chances are you're probably doing it wrong, right? In most of those scenarios, I look at those sort of pieces of code, and the entire thing should just be a select statement, yeah, nearly every time. And the thing that actually is missing in a lot of that code is just often the use of case statements. It just surprises me how little they get used for things where they make perfect sense. So for example, I see something where somebody updates a set of flights where a certain condition occurs, and then they'll update them again where a different condition occurs, and then they'll update it again where a different... You know, you don't plough through the updates of the table every single time doing that. We do one update, we use a case statement and do the appropriate updates on the way through, right? So go back and sort of rationalise, am, am I overusing that sort of thing? Uh, too much dynamic SQL is a problem. Um, I see lots of scenarios where this ends up occurring, and. And sometimes uh, it, it ends up really, really nasty. In fact, m my favorite I ever saw was uh, the end result was this. And this was a, a packet of milk chocolate coated raisins where the ingredients included select Asta from equipment table. <laughs> <laughs> so something went very wrong there with, with the dynamic sequel. But uh, this, is, this is an area where you need to tread very carefully. <laughs> right? is uh, too much dynamic SQL. And the other one, of course, is triggers. I see people who build the entire logic of their application in triggers, and you don't want to be there either. And uh, the main reasons are it's too hard to debug, right, is, is the number one reason. Um, now, in, in many cases, again, it's a case of designing around that. 
And so people will say, look, maybe I've got a table. Good example, I have a table. Some other system comes up and modifies that data periodically. And then the only, I have no control over that other system. So when the data changes, I need to do something. But the problem that people do is they then go, so that needs to be a trigger. And then that'll put data somewhere else. And they go, well, OK, so now when that's modified, that needs a trigger. And so on, and so on, and so on. And, but, but this is the wrong model, right? So what you should be doing is having the trigger be the, the least bit of code you can get away with, and then usually include build up a table variable or something in that trigger, and then call that off to a proc where you do all the code, so at least the code you could test completely inside the proc, instead of having layers and layers of nested triggers. A better solution, again, is to decouple it by putting something like Service Broker in the middle, so I could then, when the trigger fires, build up a little message, send that into a queue of data, and then have the queue go off and then process and do the rest of the work. And the beautiful thing with that is I can then turn off the queue. I don't have to control whether somebody's putting data in the other end. I can do maintenance on my side, and then I can turn the queue back on and continue with the processing, right? So this sort of thing can be very, very useful for decoupling the different parts of the application. And finally, obviously, the other one is that the performance of T-SQL scalar functions. Uh, I, I just wish it was different, <laughs> um, because from a reasonable abstraction point of view, you should be able to build up little bits of code and then just reuse them all over the place in functions. The cold hard reality is in SQL Server today, that's a bad idea. So you'll often find scenarios where you have simple functions, and if you have them declared as a function and then you use them in a select clause or a where clause, the performance will be appalling. But if you just picked up that same bit of function code and put it back in the select or the where, it'll, it'll run really fast. And the, the difference is, if you look at things like table-valued functions, we have inline ones and multi-statement ones. And same with a view. It's basically an inline thing. And so if you look at the final query when you use a view, it takes the code out of the view, inlines it back into the rest of the query, and then optimizes it. Unfortunately, it doesn't do that with, with scalar functions. And so in many cases, it could do that. There is a, a, a lot of work going on in the product right now to try and find the scenarios where these are a problem and to try and fix them. Uh, because, because it is a, an important thing to be able to do that. It, it's actually a poor aspect of the language right now. OK. Another one is there are specific things I see in code when we're doing upgrades and things that, that sort of worry me. <laughs> okay, Select top 100% is one of these. right? And so you'll see this in code all over the place. And the problem is that people are trying to create a view or even a table that has a default order. Now, tables don't have a default order, neither do views. right? But the sort of scenario that occurs and why people ended up doing this is that if I, if I sit there and say, look, I want to select, uh, let's say, Asta from, and I wouldn't normally do, actually, let me do product ID and name, and I'll say from production product, this is an AdventureWorks product, and if I say order by, let's say, name, and the problem is that's fine, but if I try and create a view like that, where I say, look, create view ordered products as that, then the problem is when I try and run that, it says, no, nah, that's, that's not going to happen. And if you look at what's going on here, it says, look, the order by clause is invalid in views, inline functions, derived tables, subqueries, and common table expressions. And then, unfortunately, they said, unless you have top, offset, 4XML, and so on in there. So people go, hmm, OK, so I can't have that, but I can go top 100%. <laughs> And then, then it goes, yep, no problem. You can build that view. But, but the problem is that it's not an ordered view, right? So I mean, the, the order by is used for resolving the top, not for the output order that the data comes back in, right? Now, the unfortunate thing is in SQL Server 2000, when they first introduced this, it actually did do that. <laughs> and so the data came back in order. But that was just a, a quirk of how it was implemented in the system. It was never meant to be like that. And so the problem is that when people upgrade to 2005 and later, they end up saying, this is broken, <laughs> because that now doesn't come back in the same order that I was expecting. But it was never meant to work, right? 
But you will, if you see code that has select top 100% sitting in there amongst the code, that, that's almost always a hint that there's something very basic going on there that they're assuming works different to what it is. Um, another one that I'll just raise your attention to that I see problematic a lot is the not in function, uh, the not in predicate. And the, the problem with this one is what happens when you have nullable things. So, for example, if I said, look here, look, select Aster from, let's say, production product, and I say where it isn't in this product ID, right? So, I mean, we don't get one, two, and three coming back in here. And that's all fine. So I might say, look, I want all the products except those. What throws people, though, is if I say, look, if that's there, then you run it so you get nothing back. And that usually surprises people <laughs> when, when they see that, because you think, hang on, I should get all the products that aren't in that part of the list. And the thing is, as soon as you have a not in clause, if the thing that can be returned in here can return null for whatever reason, then this will not work the way you have in mind, right? Uh, these sort of not in clauses. So just be very, very careful when you use a not in clause that whatever you're using inside that could not potentially be null, right? Um, that's another one that, that tends to bite people in ways that are not expected. All right. So another thing is uh, kind of having a love for your data, but I think some of the, the people I work with think I'm sort of anal about this a bit <laughs> in terms of naming of things. And again, there's no right and wrong answer to this. But everybody always says, look, have a, have a plan, have it consistent and all that. That, that. That's fine. And look, I have a way that I like to name things and, and that's fine. But it really troubles me when people are inconsistent with that, right? I mean, and so a couple of things. Personal preference, straight out, it's up to you. But I avoid prefixes, right? So, I mean, the minute I find myself going V for a view or TBL for a table or I saw somebody with col for a column, you know, like... Don't do this, you know, in, in general, don't do this, right? And the problem is that it seems really easy when you first do it, but it's the sort of thing that can run you into all sorts of problems. Uh, and Microsoft is running to this in SQL Server itself. If you look at uh, even the system databases, uh, we had system stored procs and we had extended stored procs, right? Now, when they first designed these, the system stored procs were all SP underscores, Extended stored procs are all XP underscores. Um, but if you look at the list of system stored procs now, there's all these SP things, and then you get to the bottom, and there's now a bunch of XPs you know, in here. And if you look at the extended stored procs, <laughs> there's now a whole bunch of SPs sitting in the front of there. And you say, hmm, OK. So how does that happen? So, so the reason that occurs is that they decided to change the nature of how the proc was implemented. So one from being an extended stored proc to being a standard system stored proc or backwards. But they were not game to change the name of it because so many people were already using it. And so this is all of a sudden we start ending up with prefixes with the wrong name. And I see exactly the same thing, you know, where people have, say, a table and they've got TBL in front of it and then they decide to change the table with a view because they're doing some maintenance suddenly I've got views called TBL something, and, and so on and so on and so on. Th this is just not territory that I, I want to be in. I really like to see things named after what they are, you know, and, and not what, what they're, what, how they're stored either. I, I don't even like that. I'm not a fan of, like, you know, customer ID int or something, or, you know, things like that. Um, if you look at something like .NET code, the Hungarian notation and stuff was very common in the early days, but, but everybody's got past that now. Unfortunately, when I look in SQL Server land, there's still a lot of people still very much hung up in the sort of uh, Hungarian style or you know, um, data types and things in front of the names. Um, the other one is that I find that people don't tend to get, uh, make appropriate use of schemas. And so, look, if I look at something like the AdventureWorks uh, DW database they ship, see, I look at this, and if I look at a list of tables, and a whole list of tables all have the same prefix, you know, what this means is that they're trying to form some sort of folder <laughs> um, logically within the name of, of the tables. But see, I would rather that be dimension.account 
you know, rather than dbo.dim account, you know, and so on. So, like, name the thing for what it is, but if you're going to do a grouping, make that the schema. So, I mean, the schema is more like a folder in the way it's implemented in SQL Server, and it works perfectly fine for things like this. And so the telltale sign is when you start seeing prefixes on the front of things. Sorry, you had a question? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and look, that's, that's the other thing. Yeah, in fact, I'll talk about that later. The, the question is, uh, schemas can be used for security purposes. In fact, that's one of my favourite uses for them is, is exactly that. The idea that we can assign permissions at a schema level. And we'll talk a little bit about security uh, in a little while, and I'll specifically mention that because, yeah, uh, that's very high on my list of things. Ah, it... it, it, it well, as I said, you will disagree with some of the things. But it, it's just not one I agree with. I, because the other thing I find is that every time I bring those tables into a, into a tool, I'm renaming them all, all the time. Where if I have them just called customer, I end up just not having to rename it. But if it's dim customer, I find every time I use it, I'm renaming it as well. It's just, so as I said, look, you will disagree. Personal preference. Um, the other thing is trying to be not too obscure. Uh, sometimes I think people try and do this in incredibly obscure ways. But this is a system I was working on a little while ago, and these were the names of the tables, and this is kind of what the data was. You know? Now, look, if you really want to make it hard for someone to follow your system, I mean, you could choose to do that. I wouldn't choose to do that at, at any point, because it makes it too hard for yourself as well. And the other thing I find is just bizarre. I love this. This was actually the name of somebody's database. Um, <laughs> where they decided that the path to the database would make a good name for it. And I thought, OK, <laughs> not me. Um, now, in terms of data types, clearly no use of text and text and image. That's fine. Money and float are ones that I've... I've like, what I find is that money is an older Sybase data type. It's been around a long time. It's got a few nice characteristics to it, uh, but it's a fixed four decimal value. Uh, the problem I find with it is that people will often use it for things where they shouldn't. And in the case of uh, in Australia, we would typically always have two decimal places in a currency value. And so I would, again, prefer to use a standard data type like decimal or, or numerics, basically a synonym for that. But I would rather use that and have the right precision and so on. But the problem is that people look at the product and then say, I need to store something with currency or money. And there's a money data type there. They think that's the obvious thing to use. It's one of the problems with backwards compatibility is it's very hard to get rid of something like that, um, but it doesn't necessarily make it the right choice for the thing you're doing. Um, the other one is float. I think uh, obviously, uh, a common new person mistake is to uh, start with something like float for holding numeric values and so on. Uh, it's OK for certain scientific things, but certainly not for uh, things like currency. So, I mean, just to give a simple example, the, if we said, look, uh, declare at value as float, um, let's say equals zero, and then I said, look, while at value is not equal to 10, and I begin, and I'll just say print at value, and then let's say set at value is at value, I could have gone plus equals. Um, plus, let's say, uh, 10 cents, yeah, and end. And most people sensibly would expect that to sort of to run a certain number of times. But notice when we run, it's an infinite loop, right, basically, and so it'll just sort of run forever. And the problem with this, of course, is that this test didn't do what we expected. And so the, the problem is you get down here, and you look and you see, sure looks like it got to 10, right? Um, but the problem is, again, the rounding of that ended up showing 10 on the screen, but the value never was 10. Uh, and the, the problem is, of course, that in, in decimal, like a number like a third, is zero and you know, uh, three recurring. And the problem is that 10 cents in binary, of course, is the same problem, but in binary, right? And so, the, and so you can never store that sort of value exactly. And people where they use float for lots of numeric values and things for money, and so on, uh, are the ones that always end up with, you know, columns that add up and one cent out and things like that in columns of values and so on. And uh, that, again, you, you don't want to be there. You, you want to store numeric, those sort of numeric values uh, exactly. Um, also, I find um, 
people picked weird lengths for strings. And so uh, one of the discussions came up in the class uh, uh, where we had the pre-con on Monday. I was saying, look, I, a place I was at the other day, they had decided that an email addresses, they were just going to make them a thousand characters long. And so, okay. Um, but then somewhere else in the application, somebody had said, I'll make them a hundred, you know, and so on. And so what I find is that people will pick different things all over the application for things that are essentially the same thing. Now, in many cases, something like an email address, of course, the right answer is you look up the standard and you work out what the length is of an email address and that's what you use. Now, where we come into problems is that things like we're trying to build indexes and previously 900 bytes was a limit you know, on the, the length of a key and so on, you start throwing in columns that could potentially be a thousand characters and so on, that's a problem, right? Even though we should be able to index the email address without an issue. Um, the other thing is that you've got to avoid things, uh, I wish it was a perfect world where strings are really quick to sort the same as numbers, but they're not, right? And so there's an outrageous difference between the two. And the thing that people haven't often stopped and thought about, it's one thing that when you compare strings, you've got to compare character by character, that's fine. But the problem is you've got to apply all the collation rules. And so you're in there going, you know, do capitals matter, do accents matter, do, you know, and it's on and on and on and on to make one decision on one character, then you go to the next one, you know, and so on and so on. Um, this ends up being a huge thing. And so, but I, it's really important that when you declare things, they end up being the same pretty much across the system. And as I said, so be consistent. So look, one of the things that we have is, um, I have a, a set of tools that we give away, and uh, so anyway, you'll find them there um, under SDU tools. But there's a number of tools we use to try and make this stuff easier to find. So I'll just show you one straight up. So there's mismatched data types. And so I find it's a value. I've dropped this. It just drops all the tools straight into a schema in one database. And so I've just got them in the development database here. All right. And you'll find there's a whole lot of just procs and views and things that we've sort of created in here. And each one of them, too, I might add, if we like right click and modify, all the codes there, and uh, there are descriptions in here. There's also each one of them has a YouTube video that shows you how to use it as well. Um, but in the case here, like list mismatch data types, says go and have a look at the wide world importers database. And so this is the sample I built for Microsoft for SQL Server 2016. And look at all the schemas and the tables. And all it'll do is just go and quickly check that everywhere you know, something called quantity is defined, named, how is it defined, right? Now, in this case, I'm totally comfy with this because these are a different type of thing to these two. Um, but again, it's a, it's a sanity check to go through and go, you know, am I declaring things completely differently in different parts of the code? Uh, so I'd encourage you to have a look at those that might actually help make some of your code a little bit more consistent and clean. Um, the other ones are just listing all the data types that are in use. Uh, that one's also uh, fairly useful because it'll give you an idea of the sort of spread of data types um, that are being used. And so again, if I look at this one here, that'll show me all the data types that have been sort of used in that database. And then we can sort of see if anything looks odd uh, in any way. Um, a couple of others, actually, while just mentioning the tools, um, use of deprecated data types obviously is useful. Um, but things like subset indexes. So, you know, I have an index on A, B, and C, but I have an index on A and B as well and so on. Uh, we're building more and more and more to try and help you find sort of things that just smell inside the database in some way, uh, like I was saying about code smells. All right. Now, in terms of constraints, um, they, they do matter. I, I think they need to be named. Uh, I've, I've had a few different opinions on this over the years, but anyway, I have my own standard for how I sort of name constraints. One that's a little controversial is that on unique constraints, I've taken to, and uh, check constraints, I've taken to naming, the name actually has the explanation in the name of what the problem is. And so, you know, rather than having something when I violate a constraint, having a message turn up saying, you know, the statement failed because it violated constraint, you know, X something, you know, some GUID, it'll say, you know, violated a constraint UQ, blah, then it'll say name something or other must be unique, you know, or something. That'll actually turn up in the name of the constraint. And uh, I actually personally find that now incredibly useful. Um, in terms of defaults, I like naming defaults, and the only reason I do that um, is because if you ever have to drop a default, of course, you have to name it. 
um, as part of the, the, uh, the drop statement, which itself is painful. Uh, if you look at products like Postgres, you can go alter table, blah, alter column, drop default. You know, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to get the SQL Server team to do that. But what they have at the moment is they tend to generate system type names, uh, but then they, when they, you drop it, you then have to name the thing. So you almost have to write a query to go and find the name of the default uh, to, to have, be able to drop it. All right. Now, so in terms of don't be a lousy neighbour. And so locking is, isn't something you avoid <laughs> necessarily. Right? Um, but it's really important to understand lock escalation and to understand the transaction isolation levels. Uh, the session we did on Monday, we spent a fair while having a look at that. Um, but the thing to understand is that you know, the session that Brent uh, did yesterday morning was sort of along these lines. But if no lock is the answer to your question, it's probably the wrong question you're answering, uh, if, if that's the answer. Most of the time, one of the snapshot-related isolation levels or something fixes the vast majority of those problems. Um, I'm, not, I'm not okay with no lock as long as the data is very old, right? If there's any possibility the data could be changed, no lock is just too scary for me um, in, in nearly every situation. Because what you're saying is I want to give up consistency for the lack of locking, you know, and, and that's a very scary trade-off, right? So, I mean, if I'm heading down some index and somebody modifies a row from behind me and puts it in front of me, then all of a sudden I see the same row twice or three times. Or, or if they move it from in front of me to behind, I miss a row and so on. That's very hard to explain you know, when you have a report later trying to explain why rows are missing or not there or things like that. Worse, if somebody starts a transaction, adds a row, you read it and then they roll it back, your report has rows there that never existed in the database. That's much harder, again, to explain to your boss, you know, like, where did this row come from, right? Um, and, and so the thing is, you need to have appropriate use of locking. Um, but you don't want it to be heavy-handed. And the main thing for me is that you need to keep all of your transactional and locked style code as short as you possibly can. Um, it's one of the advantages when people say, should I have any logic in the database or not? One of the arguments for having all of those statements that are part of a single transaction inside either a batch or inside a, a stored proc, is you avoid really, really long round-trip time frames, right? Because one of the problem, common things that we see in, in coding is that if you do that from the client and you say begin transaction, that sends a begin tran to the other end and then we send a statement, we're tying all those network round trips into the middle of your transaction time. And, and that is not going to help you, right, um, when you start doing that. And you, you just, it's not worth waiting for all the network round trips and stuff in the middle of some transaction. It's okay if you're building toy applications, not okay if you're trying to build something that you know, tens of thousands of people are using. All right. So in terms of that, so isolation levels, race conditions are another one that I see really basic problems in code all the time. I'll see people who write code, they'll uh, read a bit of data, and then the next statement will assume that that's the same data, <laughs> you know, that hasn't changed from the previous statement. You just cannot do that, you know. Um, again, if you're building tiny apps, you might get away with it. Larger apps, you're not going to get away with that. Um, and so a good example, I see people who say, writing a statement that deletes data out of one table to put it off into another table and then go and delete the same rows, right? And so they're selecting from there, put it in another table, delete these ones. And so there are ways around this stuff. So for example, the problem is that if I select from a table with a where clause and put the data somewhere else, and then I delete with the same where clause, the problem is I could now be deleting a different set of rows. Right? So this is a fundamental problem. And so better would be to use, for example, uh, on the delete statement, there's an output clause. So I could say delete the data from here, output into that other table, and then at least I know the ones that are being sent over there are the ones I delete. Right, and so on. Now, in terms of connections, uh, what we hope for, as uh, if you're doing development, is we hope for like solid, reliable, high-quality stuff. <laughs> you know, in terms of connections, people tend to build code insanely optimistically. You know, in terms of what the connections are like, uh, but of course, the reality is that, that the networks and things that things are built over the top, and all of the infrastructure, it's not like that, right? And so you've got to deal with the fact that instead of planning and assuming that everything will work, 
You should plan for the thought that things will fail and then just be pleasantly surprised when they do work, right? And so the other way around. And so the sort of thing that happens here is I think it's really important to try and decide on every single thing you do. It's like, is there some way I, I can deal with this when it goes wrong? So uh, a good example is that when I see people write transactional code, the usual approach is start the transaction, do the work, hope for the best and commit, right? I mean, you can do that, right? I mean, you can do that and it'll work a lot of the time. A, a more realistic approach says, here's this chunk of stuff that we need to achieve. While we have not achieved it, let's try and slip it into the server <laughs> and get the work done. But if it fails, let's go and have a look at why it failed and then potentially go off and do it again, right? Things like this. That, that is a plan for working, right? Whereas the other one is a, a plan for having weird failures and things occurring to you. Um, one of the things I see all the time is I go into large organisations and they have paid an absolute fortune for equipment, highly available equipment, yet the minute it fails over, like it's designed to do, every app in the building breaks. <laughs> and then you go, so what happened here? Right? So, I mean, so the question is, did the developers do their job? No. Right? Um, because could you deal with the fact that the server disappeared for a few seconds or 30 seconds? Of course you could. But the thing is, that's not going to happen by accident. You have to have built your frameworks and things to deal with that right up front. And the nice thing is that if it doesn't even have to be a failover like that, it could be other things. You know, it could be a deadlock. Same deal. Exactly the same deal. Um, you don't want to get to a point where as your systems get busier and busier, suddenly you've got people knocking on your door saying, what's a deadlock? Right? You don't want to be doing that. So most of those people should never see. The user should never see that sort of stuff. Um, Erlen was saying yesterday, like every error should bubble right up to the user. These ones are, for me, not a chance, right? Um, because the vast majority of those type ones, I think, can be dealt with at, at the client level. Um, I'd like to deal with it at the client more so than in the database, uh, because I'm also allowing for sort of highly available systems where it might fail over between servers, and so I can't deal with it just at the server level uh, in that case. Um, there's also a whole lot of other things, like auto page repair in mirroring and availability groups and so on. The effect of those, if you haven't seen it, is that you read data, it fails and returns you an 823, 822 type error, 824. But then if you wait a little while and you read the data again, it works. Right? And so, but the thing is, you're not going to take advantage of that. All the trouble they went to build that, you're not going to take advantage of that if your code just gives up the first time something goes wrong. Right? So you need to think about that. Um, the other thing is you need to build code that connects to generic names. Um, not to, I see again, hard-coded server names and things all, all the time. Try and avoid that, right? Um, what I would rather do with an application, I try and have generic names. If I have an HR server, I'll make a connection to a thing called HR server. Uh, I will try and make sure then that the infrastructure in some way maps to where that is for this particular environment. But I really prefer to be able to pick code up and move it, say, from test to staging to production, whatever, and if the code just connects to HR server, it shouldn't have to care where that is. At the infrastructure level, I can either use DNS or I could use SQL aliases. I can push them out via group policy. There's lots of options, but I just want to be able to open a connection to a generic name of a server that I'm after and have it get to that, right? I mean, rather than ever having the, the server names anywhere near the code. And of course, as I said, try, try again. And so this is when the things occur, there's a whole raft of errors where you should be thinking about whether I try again. Now, you do need to test this, obviously, because if it's a primary key violation, it's not going to matter how many times you try it. It isn't going to work, right? And so we need to, to choose the ones, choose the battles appropriately. But the thing is, things like deadlocks, these sort of errors, 3960 is another one. Uh, that's the concurrency violation that occurs in snapshot isolation. There's a number of these that you should be considering retries for. And T-SQL, look, one of the things I find in a lot of development shops, there's this sort of hesitation to do much in T-SQL at all. And I, I, that in many cases, I, I think that's completely misguided. Because if you look at large-scale operations that you're doing on data, I mean, if, for example, if I had a, a list of products, uh, some big list of products, I could, one by one, if I needed to clear the quantity that was there at the last stock take, I could take every product out and rehydrate it to a middle tier, then change the data and then write it all back in. Yes, I could do that. 
you know, or alternately, I could just do an update across the table. Like, one is going to take forever, the other one's going to take no time at all. So I hear all the time people say, look, you can't scale the database tier, you can scale the middle tier, but if what you are doing is causing it to move enormous amounts of data around, that is not going to scale anything, you know, when you do that. You'd actually be way better off having that sitting inside the database. So I try and move the data as little as I can. Um, the other thing that is problematic with this is I see people building with various uh, frameworks and things that tend to shield them from what's actually going on. So, for example, a, a bit of code I looked at the other day, uh, they had a query that ran off and found a whole lot of accounts, maybe 350,000 accounts. They retrieved the list of accounts back into entities, and then in the entity, the very next statement they said was, has this already been processed? And so one by one, they went down and looked up to see <laughs> if that entity had been... And so, again, you start with something that could have been go and get me all the accounts that had not been processed. <laughs> you know, you just have to think this stuff through because, you know, again, retrieve all the accounts and then look them up one by one. Yes, it will work. You know, yes, it will work badly, <laughs> you know, compared to get me all the accounts that haven't been done. Yeah. You know? And so you do need to use T-SQL. And look, there's a hint. It has changed since 2000, right? <laughs> and so another problem I see is that people are still building code on, on T-SQL exactly the same as they did back in 2000. Look, if, if you're in a place that is doing that, you need to put the effort in, you know, to, to learn how to do things because there will be drastically better ways of writing the same code and usually much smaller. Clearly thinking in sets is important. I'm not a fan of old-style joins. Uh, I, I really do prefer the, the uh, ANSI 92-style joins. So I don't ever go from table, comma, table. I'll spell out the type of join between the tables. I like the structure of how that works. A um, couple of things. Another one I see all the time is count versus exists. Um, I see people that should be using an exists, and instead what they'll do is count the data. Right? And so what they'll do is they'll say, you know, is there a customer already here and what they'll do is go and count all the customers that are here and then return that and then say if that count is bigger than zero go and do something please don't do that <laughs> you know so look it's the sort of thing that the optimizer is getting better and better at trying to work out that that is what you are trying to achieve um, but you don't want to be depending upon the optimizer fixing things like that so I mean if all you want to know is if something is there don't count them just do an exist to see if the thing is actually there um, obviously, select aster is rarely a good idea. Um, the only thing, again, I, I, I don't say that 100%, um, because, again, if I'm building tools and things like that that need to be generic in a very generic way, I might end up doing that. Uh, distinct doesn't fix your join problems. <laughs> right? So, uh, again, this is one I see all the time where people cannot work out all of the appropriate join stuff. They end up with just tons and tons and tons of data coming out and the answer is they just stick distinct at the top and hope for the best. You know, like, th this is not a great plan, right? Um, don't do that. Because in many cases, you'll end up doing an enormous amount of work, and then at the end, you'll sort the entire thing by all of those data, and then try and work out the distinct values. Uh, that could end up being a gigantic amount of work, uh, by comparison. Um, union versus union all, as well. Uh, I see many scenarios where people really should be using union all, uh, but they end up using union instead. And the thing to keep in mind is that if, if you're dealing with data that isn't duplicated, you'll still get the same result. But the difference is if I'm using union, I'm going to get all the data, assemble the entire lot, then I'm going to sort the entire lot and then try and remove any duplicates before I then return the data. And that's a gigantic amount of work compared to just using a union all in most cases, if that's all you need. Performance is important, <laughs> right? So one thing you might think, uh, I see people with large databases where they have staging schemas and they'll have a bunch of tables sitting in the same database, but part of the problem is that that database will be in full recovery and the amount of logging and uh, the, the, the log growth that will occur and so on in that is often not justified for these tables that you're loading up and throwing away again, right? And so in many cases it may make sense to push staging tables and things off into separate databases that are in simple recovery um, and, and then keep that separate to the rest of the data. Up to you, it, it's an option, it's just one to consider. 
Um, also, optimise common use cases. Uh, I was saying to the guys on Monday that one of the things I see all the time is people have applications where users can pick and choose whatever they want on the screen, and then there's this assumption that you can do nothing to tune those sort of applications, right? Because you have no idea what people are going to pick. Every time I see one of those applications and I go and look at how people are using it though and trace it, I find there's about three patterns that people use all the time. You know, so you might present them with an enormous number of choices, but there'll only be a handful that most people use. And so in that case, go in and optimise those use cases, those specific ones, make them as fast as you possibly can, and then if they happen to use one of the other ones, so be it. You know, that's okay. But it will also benefit from the fact that the other ones are now running much faster as well. So overall, of course, you'll be way in front. Generally avoid query hints. I said apart from when you know something the engine doesn't or if there's a bug, yeah, um, that can happen. And look, indexing isn't a job for somebody else later <laughs> when, when you're building applications. Um, I would say in general, most single column indexes are fairly useless, right? Um, I mean, that's a, a sweeping statement, but I mean, uh, I see places all the time where people don't know anything about indexing, so the first thing they do is just index every column and, and think that'll help somehow. Um, and generally, of course, that will make things much, much worse. Um, filtered indexes, uh, I've seen mentioned a bit during the, the event. Look, filtered indexes I use quite extensively. The, the only thing with them is that you must make sure that when you define the predicate in the index, that the queries that you use have the, the predicate defined the same way. I, I generally don't see them so much as a performance issue, but they reduce the size of the database and, in, and uh, decrease maintenance time and so on. I actually really like filtered indexes. Um, but the problem with this is if I have a where clause that says, you know, where is finalised is zero, and then in the query I say where is finalised is at is finalised, it's got no chance of knowing at the time it builds the plan whether it could use that index or not, and it won't. Right? And so you go to all the trouble of making this nice little filtered index, and then it'll just completely ignore it. And so it's really important that even if you're parameterising everything else in the query, if you're trying to find the unfinalized transactions, you'd better make sure that your query says where is finalized is zero. Uh, don't add all the indexes suggested by the DMVs. Um, this, is, this is another thing. What you want to do is things like the missing index DMVs, take them as a hint that there's an, there's an issue somewhere around that, prob that area. But, but again, don't just go off and build everything that it says. Um, one of the slowest databases I've ever come across was someone who had built a job that started up every five minutes and looked at everything that was in the missing index DMVs and just created it. Right? Um, and the cool part is they forgot to check if they'd already created it. <laughs> and so they literally had like tens of thousands of copies of the same index. It was uh, awesome stuff. Um, and uh, uh, mind-numbingly slow. <laughs> so uh, that, that's not a good thing. Look, d never blindly follow this. Um, and also, don't go optimising necessarily for skewed or really small data sets. Uh, and also, of course, blind faith in tools is, is the worst thing there too. Um, Brent mentioned this earlier in his thing. He was saying, look, um, you know, make sure you rename it. Yes, I have come across that, <laughs> you know, where there are indexes on the system called name of missing index. Yes, indeed. Awesome. So look, just a couple of things at the end. Agile, I, I don't see, I see Agile used, but I often see it used as a sort of a synonym for sloppy, you know, and, and the two don't mean the same thing. Um, and what often happens is a lot of organisations is they end up building something that is quite the opposite of Agile. And so, for example, often go into places where, they, where every application in the place has embedded T-SQL and so on, and look, you can do that. I mean, every time I go to a reporting services session, I see people typing T-SQL straight into the reports and things. Personally, I would never do that, right? I mean, I think I like to see reports render data. I don't like reports working out the data. And I don't want to have to run around, if I want to change something in the database, and find every spreadsheet, every access database, every reporting services report, every integration services package, and then try every option on every one of those things to see if I didn't break something. Because what I find all the time is I go into big companies and the people who look after the database feel like they can never change anything. And it's because they have no visibility into the code that touches the database. And if they change it, they know someone's going to yell at them 
but they don't know who that is, right? right? And so they get to a point where they just don't change anything. And so for that reason, I always like to have at least one layer of abstraction in the database, a proc and view layer where I can wrap tests around that, and then at least I know that if I change stuff in the database and all those tests still run, at least I didn't trash every report in the building or everybody's spreadsheet or something the CEO is dependent on tomorrow morning, right? Um, because my life is going to be a lot better if I do that. Um, also keep in mind that the logical model that you're working with in the app doesn't have to match the physical one. I mean, if you really decide that GUIDs are the appropriate primary keys and things all through your objects, fine. But the thing is, by the time you get to the database, that doesn't mean that every table in the database has to be joined on those same GUIDs. You know, there's nothing that says, if you have that layer of abstraction, that I could just have one table that holds and maps the GUIDs to the ints, or whatever, and then I just use the ints or big ints and things right through the rest of the database. And at least that way I have one table that gets messed up the whole time, not every table in the database, right? But if you're starting with the assumption that the tables need to map your, match your objects and so on, yeah, you're going to run straight into that sort of problem. And look, AdventureWorks has been there. Um, I, I don't want to be too critical because I also just built Wide World Importers and knowing the trade-offs I had to make when working with various product managers and people, I, I, I know where that got to uh, and so why it's like that. Um, but I see people use AdventureWorks and think this is the, you know, the way to do things. And the thing to keep in mind when you look at samples like this, in, in the case of AdventureWorks, this is a database where they've tried to use every single possible aspect of the product, right? And so the thing to ask yourself is, you, in, when you're building databases, what is the chance you would ever build and use every single feature of SQL Server? Uh, and the answer is that would never happen, <laughs> right? And so what they've actually built with this sort of sample is they've built the least typical database <laughs> that ever existed, right? And so because they're trying to demonstrate particular features. And so this is why when we did the Wide World Importers one, we haven't tried to use everything. We've actually tried to come back to something a little more normal, right? Uh, in, in terms of what people might actually use. But even there, there were trade-offs. And so look, also online advice, uh, much of it isn't right. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of advice out there. You, you need to be thinking about where that advice came from. And the other thing is it ages quickly, right? And so I see things around. It's one of the problems with the internet, things don't die, you know? And so there were things that were true in 2000 or 2005 and so on that are just not true you know, anymore. And so you, you need to be looking at the age of the advice, not just the advice, uh, because often that can lead you very much astray as well. Um, the other one I want to note is just consider having someone who knows about data on the teams you're working with. Now, I'm often talking to rooms of all developers, not, not people that are mostly data people, but it's really, really common. Like, I'm working at a place at the moment that has uh, around 400 developers, and before we got there, they didn't have a single data person. Um, and so what they've done is kind of like hire 400 clones of themselves, yet almost everything they do is data. Right? And so it, it's very, very common, I find this, where you get teams that are like everybody in the team has the same skill set, and because the people hiring hire people like themselves, you know, and so on and so on, um, it, it is something to just try and push into organisations that, you know, it does matter to have someone there who actually cares about the data. Um, because otherwise, often the design... Uh, particularly schema design, things like that, they can really get out of hand. Um, particularly if they're doing project work, a site I'm working with at the moment, like every customer who asks for something almost demands it goes in a certain direction. And so the schema just starts ending up in a complete mess in, in lots of directions. And look, don't roll your own features, right? <laughs> Again, you know, if service broker is a queue, right? <laughs> and so if all you're after is a basic queue, use service broker, right? Um, if security, it's almost always a bad idea to, to roll your own security. Um, I see people doing this all the time, and, and this is just never sensible. I mean, look at the problems that you know Microsoft and Google and people have with dealing with basic authentication issues and security and things, and they have been doing this for decades. It's a very arrogant thing to think, I'm going to do that and do it better, right? Um, because people just always get it wrong you know, when they do that. And to the point that came up earlier about schemas, um, one of the, the things I look at a lot is if your app connects as like a DBO or an SA or something, you're probably, again, doing it wrong, right? Um, what I like to see in the applications I work with, uh, 
I like to see the application in a separate set of schemas. If I have a website, I would rather have a website schema. I will throw in there the procs and views that are the only things that website is allowed to touch. Right? They never get anywhere near the tables in, in any way, shape or form. And at least that way I know when somebody tramples on the website one day, you know, that user they connect in at best is going to have select and execute on the stuff that's in that schema that has no tables or anything there, right? Because it's too scary. So, but the ability to assign permissions at a schema level is good. So I do the same with reporting. You know, the Power BI, if I have to connect in from uh, a gateway, I'm going to have a, a schema in there for Power BI. It's going to have select and execute on particular views and procs that are in that schema. That's it, right? I mean, I'm not going to let it anywhere near the rest of the database. Now, I hear people say, look, I have to have it have this. Um, because they need to be able to create tables and they need to be able to do things like that, right? Um, generally, when you're doing that, if your deployment of new versions is part of the same application, again, I would suggest you're doing it wrong, um, with all respect, <laughs> right? Because what you should be doing is there should be some admin person who becomes an admin person and who runs your deployment stuff to do all that, but that's not the main app that people get to, right? I mean, it shouldn't have the permission to do those sorts of things. Uh, because, look, we, we do various sort of things. Unfortunately, in Australia, we don't have disclosure laws, um, but there are lots and lots of things that occur where, where people get systems trampled on occasionally. And the problem is we don't hear about it. Um, and what's occurring now is we're starting to have disclosure laws come in in the country. This is going to turn this on its head, right? Um, because it, all it'll take is a few CEOs getting barbecued in the media and all of a sudden, <laughs> it's going to be the CEO saying, how do I not be that next person being barbecued in the media, right? It will become of interest to them. Um, we had a large global charity uh, a couple of years ago uh, who ended up not being able to take a donation for three months. This is a large global charity. Um, and it's because their application got trampled on and there's no way we could put it back up online until almost half the application was rewritten. Um, that's really scary stuff. You know? And the problem is, though, you don't hear about a lot of these things. And, uh, but increasingly, you, you will hear about this stuff. And so it's really important to keep the admin functions separate to the rest. And finally, uh, removing code. Look, if, if you've got lots of people writing code, you need people removing code. <laughs> Just as a hint. OK. And so, look, anyway, thanks. I hope, I hope you found something of value in there, and we'll see you during the rest of the day. It's all good. <laughs>